these issues we're talking about are at every Olympics, and there's no doubt that they're getting amplified in Russia, partially because of the conflicts between the United States and Russia, but it's also true that what's happening in Russia is particularly bad, even by Olympic standards. And that leads really to your question. I mean, the U.S. delegation involves three openly LGBT athletes, uh, Billie Jean King, Caitlin Cahow, Brian Boitano, and then uh, gold medalist Bonnie Blair. Now, what's so interesting about this is that this is the first time since 2000 that nobody from the president or the vice president's family has been part of the delegation. This is very clearly a thumb in the eye to Vladimir Putin by President Barack Obama. And I'm sure there are a lot of people in the LGBT community and amongst allies who are happy that this is happening. It's a strong stance for LGBT rights. But I think people should also be very wary of it for two reasons. First of all, we have a lot of problems in this country with regards to LGBT rights. I mean, for example, there are 29 states in this country where you can still fire someone on the basis of their sexuality. And in eight states in this country, there are what are called no promo homo laws, which are very similar to the Russian laws, where you cannot propagate homosexuality um, or, or any, anything of the sort. So that, that's the first thing. So it's like we have to clean our own house. The second thing, which is really important, is the only question that matters is, will LGBT athletes in Russia be better or worse off after the cameras have gone home? And by sending over the delegation, one of the things that does is that it allows the IOC, and by the way, they're already doing this, and Putin to present the LGBT movement in Russia as a tool of the United States. And it op actually opens them up for further repression. Um, legendary tennis star Billie Jean King recently appeared on CBS this morning and talked about going to Russia as a member of the official U.S. delegation about the origins of Olympic Rule No. 50, which bars athletes from engaging in any type of political demonstration at the Games. That probably uh, came from the fact when John Carlos and Tommy Smith raised their, their arms about civil, uh, civil rights, uh, human rights back in 68. I think the rule probably was written after that Rule 50. Because it bans it, all political it bans demonstrations. They're not supposed to protest or demonstrate, and if they do, they can have their medals stripped and they can be sent home. Uh, but I also think uh, people will, uh, some of the athletes will probably have their say. And Ashley Wagner, for instance, has already been talking. Uh, Bodie Miller's spoken out mm -hmm. in favor of all of us gay people and uh, thinking it's just ridiculous, which it is. If you were um, an athlete at these games, what do you think you'd do? Knowing me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would try to do it in a diplomatic way, but I, knowing my, my personality, I would, I would talk about it. You'd have to do something. I would do something. That was Billy G. King on CBS. Uh, Dave Zirin, uh, you uh, wrote, along with John Carlos, the John Carlos story. Mm -hmm. and, and she mentioned that Olympic moment in Mexico City, the Black Power salute. Absolutely. First of all, just worth mentioning and underlining that when John Carlos went to Mexico City, he wasn't doing it to protest the politics of Mexico. He was protesting the politics of the United States, and that was fraught with a particular kind of danger and, um, and just being ostracized upon his return. But I've spoken with John Carlos several times about these Sochi games, and he is so supportive of the movement for LGBT rights and, frankly, so supportive of athletes' right to freedom of expression and their right, if they feel like they see something wrong, to not check their brains at the door when they go out onto the Olympic field. Do you think we're going to see this moment at the Sochi Olympics? I don't know what form it will take, but I have heard enough and spoken to enough people to know that there will be many visible signs of LGBT dissent and the fight for LGBT liberation at these games. Let's go to Helen Lenski in Canada. You've written a lot about gender diversity, about sexuality, gender politics in the Olympic industry. Uh, talk about the significance of Sochi 2014. I think it has the potential to change history, but the world has lost that opportunity, just as the world lost the opportunity to change history before the Berlin Games, the Nazi Games of 1936. On the other hand, there has been worldwide outrage at Putin's Russia and the anti-gay propaganda law. And that came to many of us in the LGBT communities as a pleasant surprise. Um, that there was that much uh, global reaction to this legislation and so, so much, as a result, so much LGBT visibility in mainstream media.
Uh, Jules Boykoff, uh, could you talk about, um, you, you wrote an article last year about WikiLeaks and uh, the 2014 Olympics. What did the Stratfor files reveal, to go back to what Samantha was talking about earlier, about corporate sponsorship and these particular Olympics? Well, the WikiLeaks documents revealed that Stratfor was working for a number of Olympic sponsors, including Coca-Cola. And explain what Stratfor is. Uh, the global intelligence firm based in Texas that WikiLeaks somehow got the documents from, email conversations that they were having. And it demonstrated that Coke was actually really concerned with activism at the Vancouver Games in particular. They were asking a number of questions about PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and trying to figure out in advance what they might do to undercut the Games. So they're definitely concerned with movement building around the Olympics. And just to echo something that we just heard here, um, movements create space for the athlete activists. And I think that's what Professor Lenski was saying there, in, in a way, is that if you have movements on the ground, that opens up opportunities for athletes to take a courageous stand. Do you think that the Olympics should have been boycotted, though? I do not. I think that would have just taken away the opportunity for Olympic athletes who have dedicated their whole lives to that moment, as Samantha described just a moment ago. And I don't think it really would have necessarily accomplished anything. In fact, when scholars look back at the boycotts of the early 1980s, it's pretty resoundingly uh, approved that these things really did nothing to uh, change the political situation on the ground for real people. Um, I want to go back to Helen Lenski. Um, you have already written a book on the Olympics. Uh, you said that wasn't going to be your last book on the Olympics, and yet you wrote another book. Why did you feel the need to write a book specifically on Sochi 2014? In last summer, 2013, I saw the story about the rainbow fingernails and the courageous Swedish track and field athletes, the women who painted their fingernails in rainbow colors. And then the outrageous statement by the, a woman from the Russian t track and field team who said famously, uh, there are no gays and lesbians in Russia. And then again last week, the mayor of Sochi said there are no gays and lesbians in Russia. And my book looks at the history of gays and lesbians in Russia, not just during the Soviet era, but in the last, uh, since 1993. And uh, in some regards, their position ha has improved, but the prejudice has such long-standing roots, the prejudice against particularly homosexuality, male homosexuality, um, has a long and complex history, that prejudice that I document in the book. And it's very hard to change Russian attitudes. And with Putin in power and Putin's alliance with the Russian Orthodox Church, that makes the task of um, uh, uh, trying to create more public acceptance of, of sexual diversity, extremely challenging. So we see opinion polls where the majority will say, no, gays and lesbians don't deserve the same rights as heterosexual people. And then we see Putin to the Western world relying on an argument, his argument about his demographic crisis and the fact that the birth rate in Russia is low compared to other Western countries. The death, the life expectancy is very low. He, as a man in his 60s, is at that extreme of life expectancy for Russian men. And he tries to present himself uh, quite successfully as a model of virility and masculinity and so on. Um, and in fact, on that sort of sexualized language, some um, Russian critics of, or opponents of LGBT rights are saying that uh, lesbian and gay issues are a sample of Western decadence and that that this creeping Western decadence will actually dilute Russian manhood. And then that will result in um, children hearing about um, gay, the possibility of being gay or lesbian, uh, choosing that as if that idea was never in their heads. Um, this idea about sex education putting bad ideas into children's heads. So then um, 
this will have dramatic effects, according to this line of reasoning, on the population growth. Um, Putin and others seem to think that gays and lesbians don't have kids. Uh, in fact, we do, but nevertheless, um, he thinks that would be the end of Russian, the Russian population, the and, end of the country. And, and just to explain that reference uh, you made, Professor Lenski, in August, the Swedish high jumper Emma Green Trigaro painted her fingernails in the colors of the rainbow flag in support of Russia's gay community during a qualifying round at the IAAF World Championships in Moscow. And she was forced to repaint them after being warned that this was a breach of regulations of the International Association of Athletics Federations and that she could be sent home. She said, quote, I couldn't imagine how big and how much it would mean to people, so I'm so glad that I did it. Of course, I've got some ugly messages, too, and that makes it even more worth it, she said. Dave Zirin. Oh, that, that's absolutely right. But one, one thing about these games, which is, you know, in a bizarre way, Putin has fulfilled the greatest mandate of the Olympics, which is to unite the world, and that it's united people in disgust discussed over the many different issues that people care about that are being expressed at these games. I mean, no matter what your issue, your passion, uh, your desire for social justice is, there is a part of these Olympics that will, will inflame you. I mean, the Olympics, one thing we haven't discussed is it's happening at the 150th anniversary of the Circassian Genocide, 1864. <coughs> and Sochi is actually a Circassian word. And this is a way of erasing that history, but it's actually led to a tremendous movement. There's even going to be a demonstration in Times Square in New York on Friday to, co to coincide with the start of the games of a Circassian and expatriate community here and in New York. quickly, to explain what happened 150 years ago. Oh, I mean, Joy, uh, Jules. Yes. Sure, yeah. Tsar Nicholas II uh, engaged in what most scholars call a genocide of the, of the period. And, and basically, Circassians were forced to flee, and many of them live in diasporic communities around the world. We saw protests just the other day from Circassians in Turkey. There's a huge pocket right, near, right nearby in New Jersey. There's also a number of Circassians in Syria. So basically, forced to leave their homeland for their own safety. There's also been environmental degradation in Sochi of a horrific degree. Uh, there has been announced the mass extermination of stray dogs in Sochi in the lead up to the games. I mean, so so this is literally one of those things, the violation of labor rights. At least 25 construction workers have died in the buildup to making the games. And of course, all the LGBT issues we've discussed. I mean, if people out there care about issues of human justice, I think people should realize that these Olympics are an amazing opportunity to educate the people people around you about the, the very brave movements that are taking place and the stakes involved. Samantha, could athletes talk about this, their concerns? I think it's going to be very, very I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that it's going to happen. However, there are a set of structural boundaries in place for athletes that's really tied into the, the structure of corporate sponsorship. Um, Essentially, there are contracts that are signed, and uh, in light of, of, of the fear uh, that ath athlete activism could actually become a realistic prospect, I, I have a feeling there, you know, there's going to, there are going to be requirements. Um, Olympic participation may very well be contingent upon remaining politically disengaged. Um, when an athlete ha is, is entirely economically dependent upon the, the sporting hierarchy, the, those organizations, and the corporate sponsorship, uh, and they've invested, some of them, upwards of a decade uh, in, their, in their pursuit of this moment, um, those are going to be very real questions that they're going to need to ask themselves. We're